Are you looking for a space where you will learn to improve your mental strength, emotional health, and heal your insecurities from the inside out? Take the first step to living a more meaningful life with the Better Me with Body by Brie podcast. I'm your host, Brie. I'm a certified personal trainer, entrepreneur, and mother of three. I've helped empower thousands of women to take action through fitness, nutrition, meditation, personal development, and aligning thoughts with action. This podcast is for those who are ready to feel inspired and motivated to live a more purposeful life. Let's grow together. Hi, everyone. I hope you're having an amazing day. Welcome to the Body by Brie podcast. If you have ever struggled with body shame or a low body image, today's podcast is for you. And I've been so excited to introduce my guest on the podcast today. I first fell in love with her when I found her on Instagram And I connected with every single one of her posts. She's such a light in this world. She gives so many women, uh, you know, positivity with her, with her message and her content is so powerful and strong and brave while also being vulnerable. And I was so honored that she agreed to come on the podcast today. So let me introduce to you guys, Dr. Morgan Francis. Dr. Morgan Francis is a doctor of clinical psychology, and she's also a licensed mental health therapist. So she knows her stuff. She's the owner of Scottsdale Premier Counseling in Scottsdale, Arizona. At her private practice, she she treats young adults and individuals and couples and families, and her mission is to break through the mental health shame game. And she has over 20 years of experience specializing in the treatment of body image and eating disorders. So I love that she empowers you to make peace with your body and food. And she's also a mother of three young children. And I love that because I can relate to her. So Dr. Francis, welcome. How are you doing today? Hi, thank you so much for having me on. It's really an honor. So thank you. I know you're a busy woman. You have lots of clients. So we're so fortunate to have you on here. And I was so excited to interview you because I absolutely love all of your posts and your content. You're so knowledgeable. I love that we share so many of the same beliefs. Can you tell me a little bit about your background and why you wanted to focus on eating disorders and body positivity? Sure. So um, as you mentioned before, I'm a licensed uh, clinician in the field of clinical psychology. And When I was growing up, I went through a tragic event. I lost my brother when I was 16 years old. And when that happened, my whole life changed. And I turned to food as a means of escaping and also as something that I felt like I could control since Mm -hmm. the loss was something I felt so out of control with. And from there, it just became an obsession, something that I thought about all the time, meaning what am I going to eat and how am I going to get rid of it? And soon I ended up developing an eating disorder and I was in college and it got to the point where my parents basically sat me down and said, look, we either need to get you help or we're going to pull you out of school. And I was very afraid to lose my education. It meant everything to me. So that's when I started to work with a therapist and just explore what this was all about, because it wasn't just about food, although that was a big component of it, obviously, but it was much more than that. And I remember coming across an article, and I wish I could remember who it was who wrote it to this day, because I would send her a thank you letter. But she was talking about body image and saying that body image is something that we should always be working on because our bodies are going to change size and shape. And we need to love our bodies regardless of the shape that it's in. And I just, it it just hit me because I thought I've never heard anything like that before. Like only when I'm thin enough, that's right of my body. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was just such a different perspective. And it really just changed the way I looked at everything. And so my research for my dissertation um, focused on um, body image using the body cathexa scale and self-concept and cosmetic surgery. And I just continued to explore it. And I was first working with men. Um, Ironically, I did not work with women. I worked primarily with men and body image. Um, And then when I had my third child, I knew I needed to have some more flexibility in the private practice um, sector. So I went ahead and opened up my own practice. And that's when I started specifically focusing focusing 
on body image. And I still work with men, but predominantly my practice is now females. Right. That is so cool. So talk to me about, I know, so I'm going to address a couple things that you said that was so interesting. The first one was you said, love your body in all of its phases because it is going to change. And I think that it's easy to say, oh, I love my body when it looks good, right? Mm-hmm. But, but even as a fitness professional, I remember after having kids, I was like, oh my gosh, it was such a shock that I had never seen my body look that way. It was hard to love it in that phase, you know? So what would you tell women who have had, you know, one, two or three babies or more, what would you say to them when they're going through that kind of initial shock of seeing their body look so differently? Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, I would first want to make sure that they know that this is normal for them to feel depressed or anxious and critique their bodies. Because unfortunately in our society, we don't see images of women's stomachs naturally. Really Mm -hmm. all the images we see of women's stomachs on film or media is flat with six pack abs or pregnant. We don't see anything in between. And so if we don't look what we are seeing, then we think something's wrong with ourselves. And so there can be this added pressure, right, to get your body back after post-pregnancy, but your body never left you. In fact, it just created a human. So it's really unfair, the pressure um, that new mothers have on themselves. And I mean, this, this could be a whole podcast in and of itself, because I know if you think about, you know, even just the appointments that are made after postpartum, we have what one for us. And then the rest are for our children. I know. Yeah. Yes. And it is such an emotional time. Your hormones are crazy and you're like sleep deprived. And I feel like that's the most vulnerable time that I personally have ever had. Like the six weeks after the baby, I was like, who am I? What is, you know, like, it is like a very vulnerable time. So that's a very good point. Like, why don't we have more support there? Yeah, we really don't. And our bodies, I mean, they're going through so much and each pregnancy is so different, right? And so the recovery is going to be different. And, you know, obviously depending upon how the birthing process was for you. So there's so many elements. So to think that our bodies are just supposed to, specifically our stomachs are just supposed to snap back into shape is untrue and it's a myth. And we just need to dispel the myth and let people know that your body is just is going through so much and to really move the focus off how your body looks to appreciating your body. And that's a critical skill that I teach a lot of my patients. What would be maybe like one or two steps that we could start with if we're not, you know, if we don't know where to start, like if a client is struggling, what would you tell them to help them start with having a little more positive you know, body image. So the, the first couple of things is just creating that awareness because so many times I've seen clients not realize how significant their critical talk is. And the most important conversation you're going to have is the one that you have with yourself. Mm-hmm. And so there are so many times that they're not even aware. So it's making sure that we move the person into the awareness. So we do that by noticing the critic. So noticing how you talk to yourself when you're getting dressed, when you're eating, when you're not eating, really all parts of your day, because the reality is you would never talk to yourself the way that you would, or you would never talk to your friend the way that you talk to yourself. And so you want to shift that focus from, you know, being gentle and kind and patient and compassionate. So that's the first thing. The second thing is just giving them the psychoeducation around diet culture and the history of oppression of, of, of female bodies, because a lot of us don't know the history. I mean, I didn't know. And so I, I definitely have, you know, being a clinician and specializing in this field, I mean, I'm still uncovering things myself. And so this is, this is, you know, you know, oppression of female bodies that stemmed way, way, way back before, you know, um, yeah. anything was going on. So we have to understand that there's, there's a reason behind this because when we're focusing on our bodies, meaning we are investing our mental tension and time and financial resources, then we're not out there creating. We're not out there dominating. We're not out there leading because we're hungry and we're focusing on our bodies. So it really is a way to keep women oppressed from being able to be dominant in the world. So we have to understand the the psychoeducation behind diet culture as well. And it is interesting you say that because if you look through the decades, it's crazy what was acceptable and what was considered beautiful. You know, like you have the Marilyn Monroe, people liked the hips and the curves. And then like the 90s, it was the 
stick thin twig, you know, supermodels. And like now it's all about the big booty and all these girls just want a big booty and a tiny waist. And it's crazy how it changes what's beautiful and what's acceptable for society. So that puts so much pressure on us. Like we all have such different bodies. It's just, it's just really hard. You're right. It is really hard. And the the pressure is very real and it can become traumatic for individuals. Yes. So tell me on your Instagram, you talk a lot about um, how people would compliment you the most when you were in the height of your eating disorder and how that really did a lot of damage to you. And I love how you tell women to compliment each other on things other than their body or their physical appearance. Mm -hmm. So I, I could not agree more. I think when I'm with my friends or with other girls, it's always like, Oh, you look so skinny. What are you doing? Or your hair, even your hair looks good or, you know, your legs are, and I know that it's like, they're trying to be nice, but there are definitely other ways that we can compliment and uplift each other that have nothing to do with how we look. Cause that's still putting emphasis on how we look. Yes, it, it completely does. And, you know, and I agree with you. We, I, I'm sure none of us mean to cause harm or pain to anybody when we make compliments, right? We think that that's the right thing to do is to acknowledge the person's weight loss. But we automatically assume that weight loss is a positive when weight loss is not always a positive. It can be related to an eating disorder. It can be related to divorce. I mean, I'm sure people have heard of a, the divorce diet, right? It can be related mm-hmm. to grief and loss. I mean, when I lost my brother, my weight significantly dropped because I was in grief and bereavement. Right. It could be related to a health issue like cancer um, or right. some type of autoimmune disease. Um, so there's many reasons why someone's weight might change. We can't assume that it's a good thing. And there is this, you know, horrible myth that smaller size bodies are healthier bodies when the reality Mm -hmm. is you can't determine someone's health by looking at them. Um, And, you know, anorexia nervosa, which is one of the eating disorders that I suffered from is a a clear example of that. Because when you, when you work with eating disorders and specifically anorexia nervosa, people that have anorexia are miserable they are so yeah. unhappy and they are really struggling and suffering and it's it's such a horrible disease and so to think that you know people are living their best lives when they're when they are in their smallest body is is a myth and we have to again mm-hmm. bring the facts into the picture and so it is important to really be conscious about how we greet people and how we greet little girls as well. Um, you know, I have an eight year old daughter and so it's, it's very, I'm very aware of making sure that I don't, you know, compliment her on her appearance. You know, it's about Mm -hmm. what her body does for herself, just like her brother's. And, you know, of course, you know, if I like one of my girlfriend's friends, I'm going to be like, girl, you're rocking that outfit tonight. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm like any other female, but yeah, I, I also want them to know, you know, I find them inspiring, you know, thank you so much. Yes. For loyal friend. Um, you know, I look up to you, you amaze me. You know, one of my friends right now, her husband's, you know, out of town because he's playing baseball and with COVID, you know, he can't be home. And, you know, I just had a conversation with her the other day telling her like, you amaze me. You're doing this all by yourself yourself. Like you are so strong. And that, mm-hmm. that's the conversations we need to be having with one another. Yes. I love that. I love that so much. And it's interesting because even when I was competing, I used to do fitness competitions. Mm-hmm. It's kind of along the same lines. Like, um, you know, you're eating only chicken and broccoli for months And you're working out three hours a day and you're taking caffeine pills to stay awake because you have no energy and your adrenals are shot. And like, I was not healthy by any means, you know, I was actually doing damage, but I looked in the fitness industry. I looked like I was really fit and healthy, but like my adrenals were shutting down. I had to take naps every day. I was so tired. I had headaches. I was lethargic. I couldn't even like have a coherent thought. Like I couldn't, I noticed my brain like was shutting down like, and that is not the epitome of health. Right. And so I wanted to show that to people and be like, you know, that was not worth it for me to have the nice body. You know, we have to find our balance. And I think that you are doing such a great job at showing people to find the balance. And like you said, being smaller is not necessarily being healthier. So I love that. 
Thank you. Yeah. And you really highlight what happens when our bodies go into starvation mode. And, and, you know, and the irony is, you know, I'm sure many people put you on a pedestal when you were at that, you know, definitely size and, you know, you got to be awarded for it. And so, you know, and, and, and there's no question. I mean, I've worked with a lot of people in the industry that, that you were in and you guys work extremely hard. I mean, there's lots of hours and time and money, put towards this, um, achievement and it really is a commitment. Um, and so I don't want to minimize that. And I also want to validate the fact that many individuals struggle afterwards. Um, yes. you know, you can't maintain it. It's impossible. Yes. And that's where, you know, a lot of the mental health anguish really settles in mm-hmm. people. And your posts, sorry, I, I'm like obsessed with all of your posts, but <laughs> one of them was so good. It was, it said like you comparing yourself to your before picture is trauma. Like that mm-hmm. is not healthy to compare yourself to your thinnest picture mm-hmm. and trying to always be that body type or be that person. Because like you said, things change and they, they you know, and I, I feel like I had to, I actually went through a really hard time, um, so I competed, I got pregnant uh, the month after I competed. Um, And so my body was just wrecked from that. And then after my third, my hormones were so off from getting pregnant right after that, you know, traumatic experience for my body. Like I just had a really hard time getting back to where I felt comfortable. And I, this whole year, I felt like I had to have this like journey of detaching my worth from my body Mm -hmm. and being like, you know, it's, even though I'm a trainer, it's a, it's not about me. It's about, you know, what I can bring to people, how I can motivate people, how I can encourage the education I can bring. And it was this like really enlightened year where I'm like, I am not, my worth is not tied to my body. Like it's okay. And that is so hard to learn. (laughs) It is really hard to learn. And it's just, I mean, even just listening to your story, I mean, how resilient your body is, you know, to go from, you know, being in the competitive fitness world where there's so many sacrifices your body's making to then be able to become pregnant, because I know a lot of women can't get pregnant. Right. Fertility is, you know, really destroyed during that process. Um, And then to be able to, you know, have a pregnancy and I mean, I mean, just, it's just amazing what your body has been able to do. Um, but yet as women, right, we focus on what it's not looking like, right? It's, right. You know, we're not thinking about what it's been able to do and perform and how it's keeping us alive and growing life. We think about mm-hmm. well, I wish it could look like what I used to look like or look like her. And so, yeah, it's really, I mean, it's just amazing the transformation we go through and that's exactly it. Our identity or our self-concept. So how we see ourselves um, often is the main ingredient tem- tends to be our physical appearance, especially mm-hmm. for women. And that's where I see so many young girls really struggle because with the, you know, I, with social media and the likes and the followers and all the attention that comes from posting a picture or a selfie that's often filtered, you know, it's, right. it just gives them this horrific self-concept And so oftentimes they think, well, who am I if I'm not pretty or if I don't have enough likes? And I Mm -hmm. often tell people like the least interesting thing about you is what you look like, right? Yes. You are. People don't care. People. They don't. They care how, how you make them feel. And like you said, you know, everything, like if they're genuine and they're a good friend, that's what people care about. Right. Exactly. And, and, and so what I tell people, it's like, think about what, like you like you mentioned, like your friends, like, do you like them because they've got great legs? No, exactly. I'm like, Oh, I want to be friends with her because she's got, great yeah. legs. Like, no, you don't. You think to yourself, Oh, like she seems amazing because like, she's loyal. She's trustworthy. Um, I can rely on her. She's there for me. She's funny. You know, I have a great time with her. Right. Like, those, those are the reasons that we are friends with someone. So that's exactly how they feel about you. They're not friends with you because of how you look. Right. right. So yes. it's important to broaden our self-concept and, and really develop our hobbies, our interests, our morals, our values, our faith, our career, um, it, like the other facets of our identity. And what happens is that when body image becomes the main ingredient, that's when we tend to 
you know, attach our worth to how we look. But if we are able to develop other parts of ourselves that mean way more in the context of life, then we don't have that attachment to our appearance. I love that. What, what would you say is the biggest hurdle or emotional block for women and girls who struggle with body image? Would you say it's social media or do you think it's something else? Um, you know, it's what research shows it's really like an, it's a combination. So it could be messages, the body shaming that they are exposed to within the home. It could be, um, social media, um, the environment, it could be a traumatic experience, or it could be something just genetic that they have, meaning that, you know, maybe they have, you know, they're shorter than their friends, or maybe they have really large breasts and they're super embarrassed about it. Um, or maybe it's their skin. Um, so things that we just can't control, um, oftentimes can also be a source of negative body image. Mm -hmm. So it's learning to cope with that because, you know, oftentimes people think like, okay, well, I can control my weight through, you know, manipulating how much I eat or, you know, how much I expend energy. And that may work for some time, but the reality is you're, you know, the, the diet industry is not a a successful industry. I mean, it's a 94% failure rate. So it's like going to Vegas, like Vegas wasn't built for owners, right? You know, you don't need your money and that's why Vegas is so much fun and it's so successful. It's because they take your money and that's different than the diet industry. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's the hurdles have, there's multi layers to it. And so it's, people often ask me like, what's your, you know, program to help with body image. And it's, it's not a one size fits all. It really depends upon the person and what they're coming in with. I love that. And I want to, I saw that you did a post about, um, talking about how your poor body image is actually ruining your sex life. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit to that? Oh, sure. So when I mentioned earlier that I worked with men, that was, that was the reason. So I worked with men around, um, sexual intimacy and sexual compulsivity, specifically infidelity. And so you know, their own body image was greatly, it was a huge factor into their own sexual health. Um, and unfortunately the infidelity obviously really traumatized their female partner. If I was working with a heterosexual couple. Mm -hmm. And so I noticed how many women blamed their bodies. Well, if only if I was thinner, if only I looked like her and her usually Mm -hmm. being like a totally different prototype than what she looked like. Right. And, and, And the thing is it had nothing to do with the woman's body you know, it, it really, mm-hmm. um, there was many, many problems within the marriage. And, you know, this was related to this, the man's own set of, um, you know, problems. I'll, I'll just kind of right. generalize it. So that's when I started shifting back over to women and, you know, for women, it, it does, it makes us, you know, very self-conscious, um, in the bedroom, we're constantly worried about, you know, our bodies and, and, you know, I hope he doesn't see my cellulite, you know, um, Mm -hmm. I don't want to see, you know, myself, like my naked body with the lights on, um, we can't let go. And so women, it, it, it compromises their ability to be in a physiological arousal state. And so many women, you know, don't orgasm or don't even know how to orgasm, um, Mm -hmm. they avoid having sex. Um, they don't, you know, they don't experience sexual pleasure, Um, so their body image definitely affects many areas of our life. And that is definitely an area where I see it affect significantly. Yeah. It's interesting that men would also have an issue with the body image. I wouldn't think, I would not think that that's so interesting. Yeah. It's just often not talked about, unfortunately, men. it just assumed that men are confident, um, and that's not the case. Um, and it doesn't matter how much money you have or how many cars you drive or where you live mm. or what business you own. Um, men struggle as, as well. It just shows up differently. Yes. Yes. And I, I mean, I bet men just who knows in their circumstance, but in marriage, like they just want to be connected with you, mm-hmm. you know, like they don't necessarily, most men that I know don't necessarily care. Like it's okay if you have cellulite, like just connect with me, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So that is interesting. We're doing ourselves a disservice. Yeah. So, um, 
I love how you approach weight and talking with your children Mm -hmm. about not having shame. Mm -hmm. Can you share a few tips on how to talk to your children about their body so they have a positive body image? Yeah. So one of the biggest questions I get asked from parents, specifically mothers, is how do I make sure my child um, or my daughter does not hate her body? And really what they're asking me is how do I make sure that my child doesn't hate their body like I've always have hated mine. Right. And so what I often tell mothers is that it starts with you. You know, children Mm -hmm. through social modeling, meaning monkey see, monkey do. So if you are talking negatively about yourself, your child is going to learn to talk negatively about themselves. Because children, as much as you might tell your child, you're amazing, you're beautiful, look how great you are, they're not going to believe you if they see you criticizing yourself because in their eyes, you are all those things too. Right. So I often encourage parents to do a gr- like a very thorough evaluation of their own relationship with their bodies and their food. So let's say you're sitting down at the dinner table. Does mom sit down with you? Does mom not eat the same foods? Oh, honey, I'm on a diet. Um, I, mommy can't eat any pasta tonight. No, no, no. That's for you. Um, mm-hmm. you know, are there food rules? Like you can't leave the table until you finish your plate. Um, is that a bad one? Should we not be doing that? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, I understand the premise. I mean, I was, I was raised that way as well, right? But we also want to encourage children to honor their hunger, right? And right. to be mindful of their bodies. Um, and this is the thing, you know, babies know how to do this right when they come out. You know, they cry when they're hungry and then they pull away when they're full. Um, and yet somehow we start thinking that we need to teach children about fullness and hunger. And we don't always need to. I mean, yes, do children get distracted and forget that they need to eat? Absolutely. So we may have to remind them, okay, it's time for lunch. And, you know, while they're busy playing outside, but they also are very aware of their hunger cues. So it's just about um, having those conversations. So for like my children, you know, I was leaving the house today. My son's like, I'm done. And, you know, obviously he really didn't touch his food. And I was like, oh no, let's make it fun. So we put like toothpicks in his food and, you know, we were playing a game with it. You know, children love play. And so we, mm-hmm. you know, engaging in play can be really effective to help children just be in touch with your, with their bodies. And so I'll say, okay, like, is your tummy full? Like, where do you see your tummy feeling full? No, it's not full yet. Okay. Let's eat a couple more bites to see when it can be full. So again, it's trial and error. Um, But it's really about coaching a child to become aware of their bodies rather than, you know, telling them, okay, you can't leave the table until you've eaten all of your food. Because I don't know about you, but when I was told that, I would then go to the bathroom and then, you know, take the food and put it into the (laughs) trash can and, you know, hope that mom and dad wouldn't catch me. Yeah, for sure. That's so interesting. It is such a hard balance because I have one, like my, my daughter's great at eating and then my little boy is like, he could just snack all day. So I'm like, wait, you need your protein. You need your carbs. You need your vegetables. Like, so it's such a fine line to be like, how do you help them eat? You know, if they haven't eaten all day, but then also not like force them to eat. So that is something I'm still trying to figure out. (laughs) Yeah. And the thing is, you know, too, like kids can teach us, you know, and, um, I think it's really helpful if, you know, to remove distractions, uh, around dinner time or meal time, mm-hmm. so um, like iPads, phones, TV. Um, I know many parents, you know, just need that, you know, iPad on or television on to keep the kids, you know, kind of busy while they're eating. Um, and so I get it. Um, however, it we really do want to try to encourage at least one meal where there's not yes. action. So if you can do that yeah. and sit down and engage with your children, you're really going to have the best results. Well, and then I think too, we're teaching them not to mindlessly eat. Like I, I've always heard like, don't watch TV and eat because you're not even noticing the flavor. You're not even realizing what you're putting in, you know, and then you just sit and just sit down and eat a whole bag of chips, but you don't even realize you ate the bag of chips because you're so distracted. Yeah. You know, so exactly. So what would you say to a parent who has a child who's overweight and doesn't know how to help them? I saw you did a ton of posts on this. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I think the first question that comes up with me is who told you that your child was overweight? So 
that would be my first question. You know, what makes you think okay. your child's overweight? Because I don't follow, I, I, you know, I don't use the BMI. It's, it's, I call it the BS index. Um, I know. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother, you know, podcast episode too. So, I mean, and again, children's weight t- just changes all the time. Um, you know, there might be a season in your child's life where they are larger in size, or maybe a season in your child's life where they're, you know, you know, thinner in size. And so you're kind of like, gosh, you know, I can't even keep weight on my child. Um, right. you know, he or she is a beanpole. Um, and so, you know, what happens is, you know, parents get really fearful and, and honestly, they really struggle with the, the judgment about their parenting. Um, mm-hmm. if, if their child doesn't look in acceptable and societal standards, but if your child is sleeping well, if your child is moving and I don't even like the word exercise because exercise always means that there's some kind of objective outcome that we're measuring. And I think for children, it's just about play, organic play and movement that is much more suitable for their age, you know, and they are happy and they're nice and they, you know, I, I'd, I'd much rather see a child be, you know, inclusive, meaning like I want my kid to be the one who goes up to the kid who doesn't, this isn't sitting next to anybody in, during the cafeteria, Right. Um, you know, like that, that to me is way more important than my child's body shape and size. So right. that's something, again, you know, I often explore with, with the parent, you know, who told you your child was overweight? What measures do they use to tell you their child was overweight? And why is it problematic? You know, is the, if, is a child suffering? You know, if they, if they're having, you know, mental health issues, that's one thing Then we can address the depression and anxiety or the anger or the, you know, temper tantrums. But what is it about their shape and size that's so negative? Okay. So what if, um, what if the child is unhealthy? Like what if they do have unhealthy habits or like they are eating, you know, like bags of chips for lunch or, you know, then how do you help them to see like, let's make healthier options without putting the focus on their body? Well, typically children don't just sit in eat bags of chips. Typically children who struggle with any type of eating issues will hide their food. Okay. So you might find wrappers. So that's a very common thing because they don't feel like they can eat the food in front of the parents and, Mm -hmm. or, you know, they're taking it away. And typically we see those types of kiddos that are going through a really painful circumstance, like divorce. Yeah. Might be emotional. Absolutely. You know, Mm -hmm. that it's a way for them to soothe themselves. It's a way for them, you know, to move away from the pain of the reality of mom and dad arguing, or maybe there's conflict going on at school. So typically children are not sitting there in front of a TV and just, you know, binging on food. Um, They'll do it in secrecy because they feel ashamed about it. So when I see, you know, kiddos doing things like that, you know, I often just, you know, talk with them more about what's going on in the home or what's going on Mm -hmm. at school that's causing them you know, to feel so upset. And I often say, okay, well, you know, if you needed that, that's okay. You know, that's okay that maybe you needed that candy bar. Let's try to add some other things that you can do when you are feeling upset. So for me, it's like about taking the candy bar away. I never tell a child, no, you can't eat this or you should eat that. Mm -hmm. It's broadening their coping skills um, so that they know they have choices when they're upset. And sure, candy bar does sound really good when I'm not feeling my best. But what about if I were to call somebody? What if I were to go to my dog and just give him, you know, a pet him and, and hang out with him? What if I were to go outside and just, you know, shoot some hoops? Maybe that might help. You know, I love that. Taking out the shame. Yeah, exactly. So again, I I just don't focus on the child's weight. I don't make it a Mm -hmm. negative. I don't stigmatize it. Um, I love that. You know, it's all about recognizing that, you know, it's, it's, it's not the most important thing about a child. We really want to help the child know that they're more than their body. Yes. I love that. And a lot of adults are still trying to figure that out. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> You talk about unfollowing accounts that don't make you feel good about yourself. Mm-hmm. And I loved that. I've said that before. I've actually had to do that with quite a few accounts myself because I noticed mm-hmm. that I was comparing myself or it was like such an unrealistic standard that I started feeling bad about myself. And I'm like, why am I torturing myself like this? You know, why am I just like having to just see this day in and day out? I think, do you have anything to say about that? Like how we have control over what we're letting in and what we're seeing and what we're letting affect us? 
Yeah, we totally have control over that. And boundaries are really important around the content that we consume. Um, So that's definitely something I go through with a lot of my clients is show me your social media, you know, who are we looking at? Like, who are you taking information from? Um, And then the other, I always try to add this part is let's diversify your social media. Are you following body types that don't look like yours? And Ooh, that's I, a good one. Yes. That's a really good one. <laughs> yes. Not who you want to look like, but body types that you don't look like, um, that you don't typically see again in film and TV and, and social and media. And that you never will be like, yeah. I will never be an ectomorph body type. I'll mm-hmm. never be a tall, skinny model. You know, mm-hmm. that's just not my build. So yeah. yeah. So that, I love that following people that actually have your body type. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And diversifying. Great advice. Yeah. Yeah. So learning about how, again, like body shapes come in all different sizes. Um, and so again, there's a a dominant like body type on, you know, TV or social media or that we gravitate towards. Um, but it's important that we diversify it. I love that. I have one more question. I, I love how, I think it was Drew Barrymore that you had highlighted that said that how many times growing up has she heard a woman say, man, I love my body or I'm so proud of my body. And that that was sad that she never heard that growing up from a woman. Yes. That was Kate Winslet. Yes. Oh, Kate Winslet. That's what it was. I'm like, I can't remember what celebrity it was, but I was like, oh my gosh, that's true. Like even my, my own mom, like she's a fitness, she's in the fitness industry her Mm -hmm. whole life very fit, very healthy. And she was always very aware, like you said, to compliment me and be like, you look so great. You look so healthy. You're so strong. But with herself, she was like, oh my gosh, my butt is so big. My thighs are so big. Look at the, and I have the exact same body type as her. Mm -hmm. So then I look at, I'm like, well, if she thinks that, then my butt's too big too, or my thighs are too big too, you know, because I'm a clone of her and I have the exact same body type. So if she thinks that, then I probably should think that too. You know, like it is so sad that that's, and, and my mom had every good intention. Like she, she had no, no idea, you know, that she was doing that. But like you said, I think it's taking the time to say, man, I love my body. I'm so proud. Look at, look at what my body grew, Olivia. Like, look at this baby that my body grew and, you know, yeah, there's stretch marks, but that's okay. Or, you know, I don't know. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, and you're really highlighting the point that we, you know, talked about a little bit earlier about, you know, you can tell your child until you are blue in the face, how beautiful they are, but unless you feel it yourself, they're not going to learn what you tell them. They're going to learn what you do and how you talk about yourself. Um, so that's, that's exactly social modeling. So you, yes, you highlighted that perfectly. Um, and so, Yeah. I mean, women, I think there's this um, idea that if we celebrate our bodies, that we sound self-indulgent. Yes. Um, Like I can't say I love my body or I love myself. Like that's not being humble. Right. And I, I think that's such a limiting belief for women because I mean, if we really look at like LeBron James, like he's not like when he shoots and he's like making record breaking numbers and he's, his hashtag is strive for greatness. When someone asks him about his night, he's not like, Oh no, no. Like I didn't do that. Great. Like (laughs) like, he's not putting himself, he's not putting himself down. He's not, you know, shying away from his greatness. He's like, yes, this is what I was able to do tonight. This is what I, where I succeeded. This is how many shots I made. You know, he's very aware of his greatness and no one, right. no one bats an eye. And I don't understand why women have to shy away from their greatness. Um, in fact, that's, I mean, I love seeing women shine and you shining doesn't take away from my light. Right. Um, it, it and that's only, because you're confident, you're confident in yourself. So you can say that, right? Like, yeah, yeah. And, and I've always been that way. I mean, that's mm-hmm. not, I don't, I, I never, I never felt jealous about other women. Uh, I, I clap for other women. I want them to, right. we're stronger together. Um, 
you know, I always have told my friends, like, like, I want you to feel hot when you walk into that. Yeah. You know, right. Like work yourself, like do your Beyonce walk, you know, like definitely give yourself that permission. And I think that's what it really boils down to is that women, you know, really have a hard time giving themselves the permission to shine, um, and not be uh, like apologetic. You know, I think it's just something that again, is part of the patriarch. It's part of the, like, we think, you know, by being selfless, that that makes us a better mother. And I would say it's completely the opposite that when I take time for myself, when I invest in myself, it makes me a better mother. 100%. I could not agree more. Mm-hmm. I love that. I know. I feel like, uh, when I, uh, when I didn't have a hobby or something on the side that was for me, I would feel very claustrophobic in my life. Yeah. <laughs> like, like it's just giving everything away. So I love that you encourage that for women and that it's okay. Like giving them permission, it's okay to have something that you work for that's yours. So before we go, um, I just want to share with listeners all the amazing things that you offer and how they can get more information from you. So would you like to share your two courses and your mindful messages? Yeah. So I have two online courses, um, Bye Bye Body Blame, which is about how you deserve to love your body without having to lose weight. Um, And so it takes you through like an overview of body image um, using the Minnesota starvation study experiment to highlight, you know, some of the takeaways that we can learn from that. Um, And then also the four step process of what you need to do in order to start to heal your relationship with your body. Um, It also comes with a workbook, um, which a lot of people have really enjoyed. And then the second course um, is for anything with regards to loss. So typically, oftentimes research shows that we will resort to using food as something to control when we've gone through a negative uh, experience of loss. And it doesn't have to be like, I lost someone, like a person that I love. It could be a relationship, a job, um, any, like right now with the pandemic and COVID, you know, not being able mm-hmm. to do the things we're used to doing. So the, the, it's called Loving Yourself Through Loss. And it's also an online course. And this, I really love this course because it has, um, body release exercise um, videos. So that ways for you to regulate your emotions and it takes you through the six stages of, of grief. And then I also have a free service called mindful messages. Um, so when you text the number 202-759-6205, you can sign up automatically for free text messages to your phone that are daily reminders of inspiration, empowerment, and words of wisdom around body image and relationships and um, self-improvement. And so, um, that's a wonderful service and it's just, it's been huge. I didn't realize when I started this, it would take off so quickly and Fox news got a hold of it. And so they did a story on it. And so it's been, it's been like, that's amazing. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. I love it. And, and it's funny because my husband gets them too. And he asked me the other day, he's like, Hey, I just want to tell you that one you sent, like, that was really good. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and so, yeah, it's been, it's been helpful. And then of course, through my social media, people can always contact me that way. Um, and then obviously my private practice too. So, yeah. And social media is Dr. Morgan Francis mm-hmm. yeah. and her website is scottsdalepremiercounseling.com. Yeah. And I'm going to, put all of these links on the show notes so you guys can click on any links if you want to go get those mindful messages or do any of her programs we'll have them in the show notes so we got you covered I'm so grateful for your time for doing this and helping so many women and just your light that you bring to the world I'm so grateful for you thank you so much oh thank you so much for having me it was really just a great time being able to speak with you so thank you very much I appreciate that. So remember, you are more than your body. You are strong, you are capable, and you are resilient. And we will see you back here next time.